Amen. Well, good morning. So great to see you. My name is Justin. Thanks to the worship team for leading us on this uh, great new song, uh, Psalm 23, put to music. So it's uh, my great joy to bring God's word to you. I do count it a privilege. My sister just moved up from Cape Town to Johannesburg after living for 40 years or more in Cape Town. She's three years younger than me, and she's finally made the move up here to the rest of the family. She got a job in the heart of Santon. And so when she came up, beginning of January, we had a nice conversation. I said to her, well, where do you think you want to live? And she said, well, let me rent for the first bit, just get settled, but maybe sort of on Randberg side. And I said, well, do you have any idea what the traffic is like getting into the very heart of Santon? And she said, oh, I'm sure it's not so bad. And, um, you know, actually, I quite like traffic. It's like, well, obviously you do, you're from Cape Town. I mean, she, she gets up, she basically goes to work at 20 to 8, and she gets there 10 minutes later at 10 to 8. I said to her, you do realize everybody's at the coast at the moment. You do realize that the schools haven't gone back. Let's talk in a month's time. And um, so we spoke on Friday night. We went out for dinner, and uh, my sister is a very different person. <laughs> she is stressed out of her mind. Not kidding you. She said, Justin, I'm now keeping migraine tablets in the car because I'm just so stressed. She said, do you realize you have to concentrate every moment of the way? There are maniacs on the road. You, you're just stuck there. She's having to leave uh, my parents' home at 10 to 6 just to be able to make it into Santon. She said, if I, if I take even one second at the green light, everybody, all of you here are angry with my sister. You're hooting at her, you're shouting at her, you're doing all sorts of other obscene things. And she said, Justin, you won't believe it, this past week, I just looked out at these people and they look stressed. People in traffic in Cape Town do not look like that. She said there was a woman who wasn't even smoking a cigarette. She was chewing the end of the cigarette. She had this cigarette stump and she said she was just chomping on it. So that's my sister. And that's our Santon. But we all have a Santon. We all have a Santon we go to that we hope is going to bring us peace. The security of, of finance, uh, financial success. The, 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 the peace of, of knowing that we've made it up the ladder or whatever we deem is peace in our lives. But we seek it in whatever our Santon is. And I think over the years, I've never met a single person in all my years who didn't want peace, happiness, satisfaction. We're all searching for it. That is the common denominator in the human race. But very few people find it. Very few people find it. And I think as I said last week, Jesus in a, in a sense looks out across our city. He looks out into our faces across the traffic. And he sees crowds that are harassed and helpless because they are like sheep without a shepherd. And so David writes Psalm 23 to us in the middle of his Santon, in his wilderness, and he writes to us and he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. David has found the good shepherd amidst a wilderness of want. Now I don't know if you know, but in Hebrew poetry, and particularly the Psalms, uh, this is key throughout the Psalms, often a, a concept is repeated twice in Hebrew poetry, but it's the poet saying the same thing in two different but complementary ways. And so when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, we're really on this side when he says, I shall not be in want, he's saying the same thing. If then. If I shall not be in want, then it means that the Lord is my shepherd. And I think he does something similar in verse 2. And we take in a slow walk through Psalm 23, a verse at a time, and we come to verse 2, and I encourage you to open the scriptures, but you'll see that when he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he's saying really the same thing when he says, and he leads me beside quiet waters. What is that one thing he's saying? He is saying, my shepherd nourishes my soul with the peace of his presence. My shepherd nourishes my soul with the peace of his presence. And so, with the scriptures open in front of you, and you'll see some things highlighted on the screen, let's unpack these two images. Let's ask of our text four questions. Question number one, what are the green pastures and quiet waters? What are they? Well, it's not rocket science. Our text tells us that the pastures are green. In the midst of a dry wilderness, these pastures are popping with color. They are vibrant. They are filled with, with moisture. They are juicy. They are nourishing. 
They're wonderful to look at. They're beautiful. Have you ever looked at a plate of food that just looked so insipid? Absolutely insipid. It just looked bland. You sort of gave it a sniff and it was like, whew, I'm not sure. It just dulls your appetite. But something that is, is green. Think if you were a sheep and you saw this green, it would be like, wow. Just this vivid brightness of God's provision. These are green pastures. They look good. They taste good. And as God said, right back in Genesis chapter 2, that he created things that were not only pleasing to the eye, but good for food. Pleasing to the eye and good for food. There's nourishment, but there's also beauty. Well, we see in our text that the waters are quiet. These are still waters. Quiet waters. It's a picture of rest and refreshment. Think about the sheep in the heat of the day having wandered, following their shepherd. He knows where they're going, but their their little legs are tired. Their their tongues are swollen with thirst. And he leads them to the still water. We said last week that sheep will not drink from raging water. In fact, I was reading that sheep, if they come to a raging stream when they're thirsty, will just run up and down, kind of like uh, pedestrians on the edge of a, of a pavement in New York, waiting to know if they can cross, if they can drink. Is it, is it quiet here? Is it quiet here? And you can just sense that skittishness. And they won't drink. Why? Because they're afraid. And, and that woolen jersey of theirs will, will pull them down and they, they have the potential to drown. Yes, they can swim, but they're not very good swimmers. And, and their anatomy, their, their little nose and their mouth is so close together that if they were to kind of put their snout in that raging river, it would be like when you burp up coke out of your nostrils. It's just going to overwhelm them. It's going to just annoy them. It's just going to suffocate them. And so the shepherd is the one that has to lead them to quiet waters for them to drink. And then did you notice in our text that the pastures and the waters are in the plural, not the singular. God's blessings are varied. God's blessings are many. They are abundant. The green pastures and quiet waters are God's salvation in the gospel. It's the beautiful Holy Spirit that God has imparted to us, this wondrous gift. It's the word of God which nourishes us and feeds us and refreshes us. The green pastures and quiet waters are those sweet moments of prayer where God has really just met with you. It's the church, it's worship, it's fellowship, it's meeting around the communion table, it's the blessing of marriage, it's a friendship, it's sharing a meal together, it's somebody giving you a thoughtful gift, it's reconnecting with an old friend, it's eyes to read a book, it's ears to hear music, it's gravity to be able to play tennis. All of these blessings and more are in the plural pastures and waters, and we could go on and on and on looking at the blessings in our lives. But friends, I want to say to you that there is one that stands above them all. There is one that is supreme above them all. There is one to whom I believe the pastures and the waters are pointing. Do you know him? Do you know him? He is the shepherd himself. He is the green pastures and the quiet waters. And he says to the hungry this morning, I am the bread of life. He says to any who are thirsty this morning, I am the living water. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who drinks of me will never be thirsty. Christ himself is the rich, abundant, green banquet in the midst of our center. And so just like verse 1 of Psalm 23 last week began with the shepherd, So verse 2 begins with the shepherd. It begins by answering this question, question number 2 of our text. Who is the source of these blessings? Who is the source? And we answer back, he is the source. Because our text says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He makes me, he leads me, he is the Lord. He's the good shepherd of verse 1. And as we said, that is the fountainhead. Join me. Let's climb up this mountain. Let's go to the source at the top. Let's see our shepherd because all these blessings come flowing down from there. And if you don't know the shepherd, you won't experience the blessings downstream. And oh, what our good shepherd has done to prepare these pastures and these waters. He's carefully gone and he's dug up the soil. He's cleared out the rocks. He's pulled up the roots. He's taken out the stumps. He's planted the most special grasses. He's irrigated them. He's tended them. 
And for shepherds that were out in the wilderness, he would have to scout out where there would be rocks and moisture and these little green pastures growing there, tufts of grass with dew on. He'd know where those are and he'd have to lead the shepherd to them. A shepherd would have to find raging streams and put rocks in and dam them up and dig channels off to the side so the water could quieten down so the sheep could drink. And in harsh conditions, the shepherd would sometimes have to go and build cisterns in certain seasons and make sure he covered those cisterns over with rocks so that the water didn't evaporate. He knows where he's leading us. He knows where the blessing is and he's able to take us there. It costs our shepherd his very life to prepare these pastures and this quiet water for us. Without the shedding of blood so red, you and I could never enjoy the blessing of pastures so green. Without him crying out in Psalm 22, the psalm before, while he hung upon the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You and I would never know the quiet waters. He averted the raging rapids of God's wrath that should have washed into my face, should have entered into me and consumed me. He averted those. He took them and he made them still so I could drink the very presence of God. Friends, I don't know about you, but if I know my, my own heart, left to myself, I will not find the peace that I'm looking for. I will go to polluted streams. I will chew on, dry, on brown, dirty tufts of emptiness. I will drink up meaninglessness. I won't find the substance I'm looking for. And society and shows and talk hosts will tell you, look within yourself. You have happiness within yourself. You have peace within yourself. You can be what you want to be, but it's not true. God has given you a craving and a longing and a hunger and a thirst, and he's given you these hungers and thirsts and cravings because they are sirens to tell you that you are a dependent creature. You cannot survive a moment without sustenance coming in, not from within, but from without. Food and drink. It's God's siren that you are a sheep in need of an all-sufficient shepherd. Everybody is looking for the shepherd, but they're looking in the wrong place. So we've looked at what the green pastures and quiet waters are. We've looked at who is the source of these blessings. And our third question this morning, how am I enabled to enjoy these blessings? How am I enabled? How does, how does Christ enable me to, to enjoy this? Our text goes further and says, he makes me lie down. He leads me beside. Maybe some of your parents, when you see that he makes me lie down, you think to yourself, I didn't realize Psalm 23 verse 2 was such a violent verse. He makes me lie down. And there's sometimes, oh, it's true, there's seasons in our life when, when I went through that horrific car accident where I was literally lying down and, and the Lord challenged me and said, Justin, can you be happy with just me? You're not able to serve me now. You're not able to get up front. You're not, are you happy with me? Ten months of being unable to walk and it's just you and me and I came to a real place of appreciating my shepherd. So there are times where maybe there is a firmness in those words, he makes me lie down. But I want to say that getting sheep to lie down is not that different from getting our kids to lie down. Hands up, moms and dads who are here today, and you say, right, I struggle to get my kids to lie down. Right, hands shooting up here, Steve and Lynn, you guys in the front here. Hands up all over the place. Hang on, I saw a hand at the back. Your kids are like late teenagers. <laughs> hey, Linda? Does, your mom still can't get you to sleep. And you finished matric last year. Okay. All right, come to our parenting course. But... What are some of the requirements for kids to go to sleep? Because we know what it's like. We put our kids down and suddenly we have to contend with all the things that go bump in the night. A bark of a dog and they're up. The thunder clap and they're up. A siren outside and they're up. We have to contend with sibling rivalry. And so our little child calls us and they say, Mommy, it's not fair. How come Johnny's allowed to stay up and I'm not? Johnny stole my pillow. Johnny's flicking my light switch on and off. I should really have said Justin because I'm the oldest of four. That was my role in our home was to annoy my siblings. And I remember from time to time going into my sister's room 
and saying, um, you didn't see that frog that was in here, did you? There was a frog in here earlier. Oh, well. And then what I would do is I had this semi-precious stone collection, and I'd take some of those rounded, smooth, semi-precious stones, and I'd put them in the bottom of my sister's bed, knowing that when she stretched out, she'd feel these cold stones, and she'd shriek. And it just never gets old. And I passed it on to my daughters, and um, yeah. But that's some of the, the frustration of sibling rivalry. And then what do parents have to deal with as well? All the irritating distractions. I'm so hot, Mom. Please, can you bring me some water? Oh, it's too dark. It's too light. Uh, Amber used to always say to me, Dad, my door's not completely open. It's like it's this much. There, I pushed it that much. Yeah, that's better. Now, now, now I can sleep, Dad. You know? The mozies are coming. The dogs are barking. The pillow is lumpy. Anything that just even slightly irritates them in their app. And then what about hunger? Mommy, Daddy... I'm hungry. My boy, why didn't you eat your supper then? I, I made a wonderful supper and you didn't eat it. But I wasn't hungry then. Okay, so would you like me to take that supper and warm it up and I can bring it to you now? Um, no, because my tummy sore. Okay, well, my boy, why is your tummy sore? Well, my tummy sore because I'm still hungry. And, and, and so we, we know what that's like as parents, but it's the same for a shepherd. Certain requirements have to be met in order for a shepherd to get his sheep just to lie down. What are some of those requirements? I've been so helped by reading the background and, 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 and reading some commentaries that have been written by real life shepherds. Here's one of the requirements. The first one is exactly what we've been talking about, freedom from fear. Freedom from things that go bump in the night. A scared sheep's not going to lie down. We've already said the scared sheep's not going to drink the water. Why? Because sheep can't run very well, they can't hide. We said last week that they're bright white, they can't camouflage themselves, they don't have noxious fumes that they can squirt out like skunks, they don't have claws, they don't have fangs, they don't have venom. When fear comes, that fear literally attacks them. And just think about being a sheep. Imagine living your entire life knowing that everybody that's looking at you thinks, huh, huh, you'd look a lot better with mint sauce and gravy. It's just you live with that fear. And so Philip Keller, in his excellent commentary, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Philip Keller's book sold millions of copies. He recounts the story of guests arriving at his farm and this little poodle jumping out of the car and giving one bark. And he says all of his sheep there in the twilight who'd laid down, who were getting ready to go to sleep, who were just peaceful and content, every single one of them up on their feet, scattered in a million directions, and he said from then on, he asked his guests not to bring any dogs, no matter how small, even if it was a lap dog. But that's us. One bark distracts us. We're trying to have a quiet time. We're reading and suddenly something pops in our mind. That bark scares us awake. We're trying to have a prayer time and our, our, our thoughts are scattered in a million directions. No sooner we're lying down, we're up again. And we're down again, we're up again. We live on this knife's edge and life is so fragile and news can come so quickly and fear creeps up on us all the time and gives us a fright and we're skittish and it can be a call, it can be news, it can be devastation, it can be opening the, the internet and seeing what's happening in the news. But the one thing I've seen about sheep is that when the shepherd comes near, when his presence is there, everything's okay. And I look at sheep, physical animal sheep, and I think, Justin, why are you so slow? Your shepherd is as near. And I think it's true of us that we are not as quick as those little sheep to say my shepherd is here and to be comforted by his presence. A.W. Tozer in that classic book, The Pursuit of God, says if God is present at every point in space, if we cannot go where he is not, cannot even conceive of a place where he is not, then why has not that presence become the one universally celebrated fact of the world? The patriarch Jacob, in the wasting, howling wilderness, gave the answer to that question. He saw a vision of God and he cried out in wonder, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Jacob had never been for one small division of a moment outside the circle of that all-pervading presence. But he knew it not. That was his trouble and it is ours. Men do not know that God is here. That God is here. What a difference it would make if they knew. Friends, God is here. The shepherd is near. 
So there's freedom from fear, but secondly, there's freedom from antagonism, that sibling rivalry that goes on. A sheep will not lie down if there are sheep bullies within the flock. We're not talking about enemies from outside, we're just talking about within this flock, there can be sheep bullies. Douglas McMillan is another shepherd. He shepherded for many years in Wales. And in his book on Psalm 23, he writes, sometimes I would see my sheep standing up and I would know right away what was wrong with them. There she would be, the big sheep, showing what a fine sheep she was. She would go up to a sheep that was lying down. She would stamp her feet. She would dilate her eyes. She would become fierce, he says. And you would see the other poor sheep getting up and running off. Then she'd go to another sheep and so on and so on until she had the whole flock up and she'd not stop until she saw me. I had a special whistle for that kind of sheep. Once I'd whistled, she'd calm down and as he could only say in his Welsh voice, and in a wee while, they would all be lying down again. Sheep will not lie down if there's any kind of antagonism or frustration or tension. Guess what? There are even bullies in God's flock. Do you know some of them? I've been in many churches, and I think there's very few churches that don't have bullies. And the question is, do you just run away from them? Do you not deal with the issues? Do you take revenge? Do you lash out at them? The scripture has a lot to say about how to deal with conflict within the body. Or do you wait for the presence of the good shepherd to come? Sometimes God in his mercy and grace and love disciplines. Discipline is a painful thing at the time, but it's actually evidence of love. And the good shepherd places under shepherds, leaders and elders and pastors to sometimes exercise that church discipline on his behalf. And when it's handled correctly and in love, then it brings healing. It allows the sheep to lie down. And so any church that allows divisive or over-controlling bullies to just destroy the flock and disturb the flock need to be disciplined in love. It's the presence of good shepherds that make the sheep lie down. Number three, the third requirement for us to experience these blessings, we need freedom from irritation. And in certain seasons of the year, sheep will be just tormented by flies and parasites and ticks and all, all sorts of other chochos that just annoy them. And a sheep that is bugged by these things and harassed and is just tormented will not lie down. And so again, it comes back to our shepherd. He has to anoint their head with oil, which we'll look at. He has to put those insect repellents on. He has to plant special groves of trees that can shelter them in certain seasons. He has to look out in certain seasons for particular kinds of parasites that will get in and maybe burrow even through to the brain and destroy those sheep. It's the presence of the shepherd that makes the sheep lie down. The fourth requirement. Mommy, I'm hungry. Freedom from hunger. If sheep are hungry, they'll just remain restless. The skittishness. They'll never lie down in the grass. They'll be nibbling here and running here, but they'll never really rest. And brothers and sisters, guests and visitors, I want to say to you that every spiritual hunger and every spiritual thirst has been met in Christ. And every effort of yours at obtaining merit and obtaining grace Every effort of yours to try and find the green pastures and try and find the water is in vain. It has been fulfilled and met by Christ. It's been accomplished by Christ. And all you and I have to do is simply come and we just lie down in the green pastures of God's grace. And we just say, Lord, this is wonderful. You have provided this. I haven't lifted a finger to provide this. You have provided this. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me. Come, all you are weary and heavy laden, all of you that have been burnt out on religion, who've been trying endlessly to earn God's favor, to try and find this peace. Come, come to me. All you are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. And I will give you rest. Well, before we move on to our final point this morning, I want to share with you a beautiful Arabic translation that I came across. And some of these Arabic translations are beautiful because they are translated out of the context of the Middle East where they have shepherds, they understand an agrarian culture. And so this translation beautifully translates Psalm 23 and verse 2 in this Middle Eastern way. It reads, He settles me down in green pastures. 
Don't you love that image? He settles me down in green pastures. There's such warmth there. It's not just a making me lie down, it's settling me down. Justin, just settle down. Settle down. And it's a picture to me of the Holy Spirit, God's precious Spirit that comes and makes Christ real to me, His nearness that opens my eyes to the wonders of God's glory and it settles me down. The Holy Spirit, He settles me down. And it made me think of a few months ago, the end of last year, and I had to have an operation on, on this eye. And it's quite a scary operation. I mean, some people are fine with, with operations, and I'm pretty much fine, but th- this one did bother me a little bit. And they were going to do an op on this eye, and in layman's terms, essentially, they were putting a, a metal straw straight into my pupil, to the back of my eye. Then they fire this thing up, and it's vibrating at massive speeds and basically vaporizes your current lens. And then as a straw does, it just suctions that lens out so that everything goes blurry. And then down the straw, they just pop in a brand new lens. Boop, and it opens, and you're good to go. You never need glasses. You'll die with those lenses in. But as I was there, I thought, I have to stay conscious for this whole operation. I have to look into Jenny Lathwaite's face. And look, it is a nice face, but I don't want to be mean to her. But it was more the, 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 the thought of her poking this needle into my eye while I stay conscious, watching my own torture. And this beautiful, wonderful, just so loving elderly nurse who's worked at the Johannesburg Eye Hospital maybe for a while, I don't know, came, she settled me on this bed that was going to be used for the, the, the procedure. And then she said to me, shame your blood pressure's a little bit high, don't worry, that's quite normal for someone who's going to gouge your eyes out. No. Um, <laughs> Your blood pressure is a little bit high. You're probably just a little bit nervous. Uh, let me bring a duvet and cool you down. And she, she tucked me in. She said, here you go, my little boy. Uh, here, let's tuck you in. Are you feeling cozy? Are you feeling... It was like I was like a 45-year-old toddler. I was just thinking, this is, this is, this is amazing. She's settling me down. She's, she said, sweet dreams. You'll be okay. And it just, for me, was, she was a picture of, of God's spirit and what his spirit does in our lives to settle us down. All of these requirements is because of his grace. We've looked at the green pastures. We've looked at the quiet waters. We've looked at the he who is the source of all these blessings. We've looked at how he makes me lie down, how he leads me beside quiet waters. Let's look finally at our response. As you and I and I say, okay, how do we apply Psalm 23 and verse 2 to our lives? I want to ask our final question. Question four, how do I respond to these blessings? How do I respond? Well, our text tells us he makes me lie down in green pastures. Yes, God has taken the initiative. Yes, he's dug all these things up and he's put the stones where they need to be and the streams and all that we've spoken about. He's done all of this. He's taken the initiative. But you have to take your little stick sheep legs and bend them and lie down. You have to appropriate these blessings. To mix the metaphor, you can take a sheep to water but you can't make a drink. You have to respond. God's grace enables you to respond. There's all this blessing. It's all around you, but you have to respond. You have to lie down and you have to bend your will and be led to these waters. Imagine I said to you, my wife, Liesl, makes the most amazing food. Man, it looks great. It smells great. It's so nourishing. You should really try some of it. But then I say to you, to really be honest with you, I've never touched the stuff. Never touched it. There'd be some problem. You'd think, okay, well, Justin, you're lying or she's not a good cook. The fact is, if that is all true, I have to appropriate it. There's something wrong with me to see all of that blessing and to say, well, actually, I don't eat this stuff. And in Psalm 23, verse 2, the sheep are lying down on top of their food. Did you see that image? The Hebrew word means to be stretched out. Lying down means to be stretched out. They are stretched out on top of their food. Who lies on their plate of food? Sheep do. And it's a picture of sufficiency. They've eaten enough, they can lie down. And if they just sort of turn over, they can just have a little nibble, 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 nibble. But they're just there, sufficient, content, at peace, lying on their food, lying on abundant provision. It's a picture of surrender and trust, of the sufficiency of Christ, being a doer of God's word and not just a hearer. It would have been great to have had a testimony time and for us to share together of times that we've experienced the Lord's presence, maybe in certain really, really special ways. Maybe a moment where you were just anxious and you opened God's word. It was like God spoke to you. It was a service where the tears were streaming down your face as the songs just spoke to your situation or you felt the preacher was speaking just to you. 
and times of prayer where you just shut out the world and it was as though God was so near, you left that prayer time and you said, Lord, I can face the world, I've experienced you. One of my colleagues this week, I just said to him, how's your day going? And he said, oh, Justin, I had such a sweet time with Jesus this morning. Oh, and I could just see it on his face, it was sustaining him in the midst of the wilderness. So can I ask, how can you respond and lie down? How can you follow and drink? I just want to suggest two very simple things that come out of our our verse. Number one, meditate on God deeply. That's what this image of lying down means. Meditate on God deeply. Lying down means stopping, pausing, breathing, smelling this green pasture, the beauty of it, allowing your senses to just soak it in. Just saying, let me think, let me churn over, let me take time to digest all that I know and have experienced. I think that's our problem. We have spiritual indigestion. We have all this knowledge, all of this truth. We've been in Bible study for years, and as somebody said to me in high school, he said, Justin, head knowledge is like having blobs of sun cream all over you, and you've never rubbed them in. You just look terrible. You've got to rub it in. You've got to apply it. You've got to appropriate it. You can't just rush. And I think we, 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 we rush from verse to verse. We're up and down the stream of life. We're like those pedestrians on the edge of the pavement and we don't just stop and say, Lord, let me just take verse two and for this whole week, that's all I've done is just let me think about verse two in the traffic, in the stress, in the moments, in the lying down at night, in the waking moments. And that's why I hope that part of the series will be modeling for you what you can do, just focusing on each word and, and, and allowing God's word to be rich to you. I don't know if you know, but in the Hebrew, the word for meditating and the word for grumbling is actually the same root word. I I remember discovering that about 15 years ago. Meditating and grumbling. And all the difference is, is in grumbling, you're meditating on the wrong thing, and in meditation, you're meditating on Christ, the right thing. And you could be here this morning, and instead of meditating deeply, you are grumbling. You're wallowing in the the, the wallow of self-pity, you are in the green pastures, but you're not really in the green pastures because there's a, there's a discontent. You're, you're, you're actually over this side on these tufts of grass, wallowing deeply in self-pity and chewing on those things and ruminating those things in your mind. But the Lord this morning gives you an invitation to come. It's an invitation to lie down, to drink deeply. And that's why David wrote in Psalm 63, my soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And how did he do that? This is how. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. How do you want to be satisfied with the richest of food? Meditate on your bed. Think about God through the watches of the night. So that's number one, meditate on God deeply. And then secondly and finally, meditate on God anywhere, at any time. Everywhere. The Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, is a new translation. I think it came out about a year or two ago. I've been using it in my devotional life the past year and a half or so and absolutely loving it. And they also have a beautiful translation of Psalm 23, verse 2, which also captures the Hebrew. Sometimes Hebrew verbs have multiple ways that can be translated. This is what the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, says. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He lets me. He lets me. And the image that came to mind was of a child. There's nothing more beautiful than watching a child sleep. And do you know what? A child can sleep anywhere. As long as mom and dad are near and they can pick me up and carry me to the car or take me to my bedroom. We all remember what that was like. Let me just pretend I'm asleep so so a parent or a guardian can, can carry us somewhere. We know that feeling. Now, you as an adult don't have that right. You can't just fall asleep wherever you want. I know some of you think that that's okay in church. That's your business. But it's beautiful for a child. It's not so beautiful for an adult. An adult like my brother-in-law, Dwayne, who's sitting there. Put your hand up, Dwayne. There he is. Let's single him out. He's wearing his blue shirt. Now, that's my other sister, Holly. But Dwayne can fall asleep anywhere. He's one of those guys that doesn't matter what he's doing, he can sleep on a cement floor and he'll be out. You cannot wake him up. I was his youth pastor for many years before uh, he and Holly were married, obviously, and I remember one night as we had a debriefing, all on the mission trip got to share, and every night, same thing you get to Dwayne, he's out. I remember one evening we all just left and we just left him and he was still in the same place. And 
Dwayne can sleep next to the pool, he can sleep during a conversation, he can sleep in front of the TV, he can sleep on Christmas Day. It doesn't matter what the event is. And you know what? His wife, Holly, even now, is elbowing him, him, him in the ribs, which means she is more like those bully sheep that I was talking about earlier. <laughs> because Dwayne has the blessing of God because Psalm 23 verse 2 says, he lets me. He lets me lie down anywhere I want because God is ever-present. He is everywhere. And you can, you can redeem the traffic. I am giving you, as one of the pastors here, permission to lie down in the traffic. Lie down in the traffic. Redeem the traffic. Listen to sermons in the car. Listen to great worship music. Find God in the traffic. Lie down there. One of my colleagues said last year he was, he was doing this eating three meals a day, spiritually. He said, Justin, we eat three meals a day physically. I've decided I'm going to spend a brief time with God in the morning, one at lunch, one in the evening. I want to experience God in the day. A Bible study that, that I led, we decided that we were going to set our phone alarms for random times in the day to pause what we were doing, to think about God, to experience, to recognize His presence. And I can tell you it was tough because my alarm would go off and I'd think, not now, Lord, this is a stressful, this is, I'm busy, I'm racing. And I realized, no, I've got to bring God into my life. I've got to lie down. He lets me lie down wherever I am because He's near. Redeem the Lord's day, even today, by using it intentionally. What a privilege that we have to lie down anywhere at any time throughout the day. And God doesn't take us out of the wilderness always. He may. He didn't take David out of the wilderness. I'm quite sure David was writing this in the thick of the wilderness. But he enables us to find the green pastures and find the water in the midst of the desert. You don't need a special temple, a special chapel, all sorts of chants and rituals in certain places, anywhere. Every gift, every challenge, every loss in your life, every joy, every gift you receive, every meal is a chance to pause and stop and enjoy and worship. And if you have the right eyes, you will begin to taste heaven. If you have the right ears, you'll begin to hear paradise. Everything that we enjoy in this life that comes from God, and it all does because every good and perfect gift does, is a foretaste of glory. The green pastures and quiet waters, my friends, are not a place to find. They are a person to know. A person to know. And so I close with these words from Toza from The Pursuit of God. He challenges us and says, Why do the children of God know so little of that habitual conscious communion with God which the Scriptures seem to offer? The answer is our chronic unbelief. An inward numbness towards spiritual things. This is the condition of vast numbers of Christians today. We need to continue to pray for revival in our own hearts. He says a spiritual kingdom lies all about us. Those pastures, they lie all about us, enclosing us, embracing us, all together within the reach of our inner selves, waiting for us to recognize it. God himself is here awaiting our response to his presence. This eternal world will come alive to us the moment we begin to reckon upon its reality. Oh, self-sufficient sheep that you are and that I am, surrender your weary legs and lie down in green pastures. Surrender your stubborn sheep will and be led to quiet waters. Find the peace that you're looking for, the peace that can be found in recognizing that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Yes, our great shepherd, we come to you now in prayer just to say thank you for mercy, thank you for grace, thank you for choosing us as your sheep, for bringing us into your fold. Lord, we long to recognize your voice and to be led by it, to hear you speak. But Lord, most of all, we long to experience you Lord, may we look past all the secondary blessings and gifts which are so wonderful and not forget the giver of these gifts that we might recognize that you are the source, you are the provider of these gifts and you in fact are the very gift for God so loved the world that he gave and he gave you our great shepherd and you came to lay down your life for the sheep. You lay down in wrath and in agony and in pain, you lay down on the cross so that we may lay down on green pastures and be led not to a torrent of wrath, 
but to sweet, refreshing, smooth, flowing, nourishing, soul-quenching waters. Oh Lord, make these truths real in our life. May we meditate on them. May we not just see them as beautiful words on a page, but may your reality in and through your spirit become a reality that sustains us in the center of our lives tomorrow morning. Because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.